Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day Special Lecture 2020. My name is Chris Klinger. I'm the chair of the End of Life Issues theme team for the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this special lecture on behalf of our sponsoring organizations, the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto, the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly, and Pallium Canada. We're really delighted to have you on board for this special lecture today that is really focusing on the issues of my care, my comfort in hospice and palliative care. World Hospice and Palliative Care Day is a special day that is celebrating the two movements of hospice and palliative care worldwide. We're really pleased to have you on board for this lecture. And with the next slide, I'm just gonna give you a short overview about the ceremonies today. So after my introductions, we will hear from Esme Fuller-Thompson, the director of the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto, about an update about educational initiatives there. And she's also then gonna introduce our special lecturer, Dr. Sandy Buckman, the Freeman Chair in Palliative Medicine over at North York General Hospital and the past president of the Canadian Medical Association. After that, we will have an opportunity for short question and answer section. And please use the Q&A button that is down at the screen for you to post these questions all across the lecture. Please also note that this lecture is recorded and it will be available afterwards via eHospice Canada. Following the lecture and the questions and answers, we will have a short awards ceremony completed by Jeffrey Mote, the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada. Thank you so much for your interest in the session. And I turn it over to Esme. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. I'm so delighted that you're here today for the World Hospice and Palliative Care Day a special lecture with Sandy Buckman. We're in for a treat. Um, I'm the director for the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of a background for us. We are University of Toronto's only interdisciplinary venue for the study of aging from a social science life course perspective. Uh, originally, we started as a program in gerontology in 1978. And in 1989, we were established uh, as the Institute. We have 75 really gifted uh, affiliated members, cross-appointed faculty from eight, 17 different departments across uh, departments and faculties across the university. And we have 100 graduate students who are doing collaborative programs with us. So if, you, if that hat for, fits you, that you're a faculty member or a grad student or a postdoc, please come talk to us. We want to expand our, um, our home. We're very welcoming for uh, in initiatives from almost every discipline or almost every er discipline. Um, our lead faculty since 2015 has been the factor in Wintosh faculty of social work. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got a few different pillars of our activities. We have the main one is graduate education. We have this collaborative specialization in aging, palliative and supportive care across the life course. And we have two options. Um, we started in 1997 with this uh, and we continued to 2006 by adding the palliative option. We do an undergraduate course because we find that many students at 20 or 22 don't necessarily think of aging and aging related professions as a job. So we're excited to kind of raise the profile of gerontology, geriatrics and, and aging related issues. And we find that many are streamed into uh, joining us at the graduate program level. Um, we like to facilitate research across our affiliated faculty members, help with grant applications and with knowledge mobilization. And we do a lot of community outreach with our social media and our weekly mail outs. Um, be happy to have you join our, our uh, social media. We try to keep people up to date on research, not just within the university, but in, on aging in general. We also have, are starting a new series of COVID-19 for talks for seniors who are sheltering in place and would like to get resources. And we have a series of um, workshops for practitioners uh, of older adult, with older adults on different topics. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, as I mentioned, the collaborative specialization is really at the heart of what we do with 100 graduate students. Many graduate students, whether they be in nursing or geography interested in age-friendly communities or music interested in later life composers, there's not much aging specific content in their home department. So the idea is that with this collaborative specialization, we can add value um, and an interdisciplinary context. Um, the core courses on, for the aging stream are offered through the Institute for Life Course and Aging and then our partner institution, um, the Global Institute of Psychosocial Palliative and End of Life Care, at, uh, which is also known as GPEC and Gary D Roden is the director, is uh, in charge of the palliative options. May I have the promo video now, please? So in my first day, I remember walking into the classroom and there were students from public health, SLP, pharmacy, social work, and as a nursing student, that was my first time being, you know, ex experiencing a classroom that was so interdisciplinary. And I really carried that through in my research because it was really valuable for me to hear other people's perspectives, especially when it's um, in relation to aging. I enrolled in the collaborative specialization during my PhD um, because I had a passion for geriatrics and gerontology and there was a real lack of courses that taught the material focused on aging and geriatrics. So my research interests lie in the area of aging and questions of gender and care and disability. So I chose to do the collaborative specialization really to nurture those interests and to also find a home um, for this, my specific interest in aging, which um, at the time that I began the program, I wasn't finding in my home department. I'm very interested in the ways in which adverse exposures in early life affect long-term health. And this interest really began to take shape and was cultivated during my coursework for the collaborative specialization. Content in the courses really helped me broaden my thinking about the structural factors that influence the experience of getting older in our society. And that's really helped me um, recalibrate and reframe a lot of my research questions. Um, those formative experiences, having opportunities to work closely with faculty and to work on research projects with faculty, ultimately changed the whole trajectory of my career and now form the basis of my doctoral research. So what I've learned at the Institute in particular is how to translate uh, the theories and the concepts that I learned in anthropology towards this kind of audience and this kind of work. Throughout my program of research, I continue to use the main principles from my aging courses from the Institute. Um, I also include a lot of stigma. My research is focused on technology and older adults. And so a lot of that is um, been informed by a lot of the theories that I learned from the uh, collaborative program. The Institute for Life Course and Aging offers a range of resources and learning opportunities beyond the core requirements of the collaborative specialization. As a graduate student, you gain a lot from this program, not just um, from an educational perspective, but also leaving with really strong relationships and with a team of people who just want to see you succeed. So I would say get involved in um, the collaborative specialization program is just full of different opportunities. Thank you so much. So we do also offer online workshops for healthcare and allied professionals. We have a variety of topics, CBT and depression, CBT anxiety, um, which is sorry, cognitive behavioral therapy. But we do have some end of life specific topics about grief and loss, 
power of eternity, uh, uh, capacity and consent, end of life interventions for palliative individuals and their families. So the idea is that they're really hands-on skill workshops offered online on a monthly basis for those who are practicing the field. Um, next slide, please. So I, it's my honor to uh, present today our speaker. So Dr. Sandy uh, Buckman is the past president, just past president of the Canadian Medical Association. I can only imagine that this must have been the most demanding year in the history of the Canadian Medical Association to be the president. And we were very lucky to have Sandy um, at, at the helm for that year. Um, he received his medical degree from McMaster University in 1981, and he completed his family medicine residency training here at the University of Toronto in 1983. He was an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto since 2005. And he's provided home-based palliative and end-of-life care through the Temi Latner Center for Palliative Care at the Sinai Health System in Toronto. He most recently practiced, practiced palliative care with the Palliative Education and Care for the Homeless. The acronym is PEACH. It must be the best acronym in Toronto. Uh, the PEACH program under the auspices of the Inner City Health Associates and St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. He now serves as the Freeman Family Chair in Palliative Medicine and the De Medical pra Director of Palliative Care at the North York General Hospital in Toronto, as well as the medical lead of a new residential hospital, hospice in Toronto. He's practiced comprehensive uh, family medicine for 22 years, and his special interest has been in primary care, cancer care, palliative care, HIV AIDS, global health, and social accountability. He recently chaired the primary care committee of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and the Social Accountability Working Group of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. His past roles include president of the College of Family Physicians of Canada in 2011 and 12, and the Ontario College of Family Physicians in 2005, 2006. He's received so many awards for his work as a family physician and a teacher, including the Award of Excellence from the College of Family Physicians of Canada for his work as a regional primary care lead for the Toronto Regional Cancer Program at Cancer Care Ontario. Excellence in Continuing Education from the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. And so telling, he was also recognized as Family Physician of the Year for Southern Ontario by the Ontario College of Family Physicians. Outside of his medical practice, he's devoted many volunteer hours to helping provide hospice care for the homeless. And he's also participated in medical missions in Africa and South America. Uh, despite this busy schedule, he also is an avid windsurfer and has a cottage in Halliburton. He's married to Gary Gail ba Baker, has three sons, three daughter-in-law, and as of six weeks ago, a sixth uh, grandchild. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Bookman. We can't hear you, Sandy. Here we go. Oh, there we go. I didn't have the ability to unmute, so, so thank you. Um, Esme, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's really uh, an incredible uh, uh, honor to be here today and address you. And so just to wish everybody a uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, uh, wherever you are. I hope you're safe and well. Um, but before I begin, uh, I'm speaking to you from Toronto, uh, Canada. And so I wish to respectfully acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of the Mississauga, Anishinaabeg, and Huron-Wendat. And this territory is covered by the Williams and Upper Canada Treaties. I offer my gratitude to our First Nations, for their care of and teaching about our earth and our relations. May I honor those teachings. Next slide, please. 
So again, it's, an, it's really a special privilege to deliver this lecture and join with you all to celebrate World Hospice and Palliative Care Day, especially in this most challenging time of COVID-19 across our globe. I'm deeply grateful and express my thanks to the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly, the Institute for Life Course and Aging at the University of Toronto and Pallium Canada for this honor. I hope I can do it justice and I'll, I'll sure try. Next slide, please. And really just my disclosures, uh, I have no relationship with commercial interests, uh, but I do receive a stipend as uh, past president of the Canadian Medical Association. Next slide, please. So to me in my career, I have found palliative care to be the most uplifting of uh, disciplines. This photo that you see here today inspires that up, uplifting feeling in me about palliative care. And I've embedded other natural Canadian scenes into this presentation. These photos are courtesy of a good friend of mine, Dr. Kingsley Watts. And he traveled the country this summer uh, and fall in a self-made isolating camper. And so these photos inspired me and they allow me to share a bit of Canada's beauty while reflecting on the importance of our discipline of palliative care in the pandemic. So part of the uplifting of palliative care to me is that we can empower patients to define their own trajectory. We're there to prevent and to relieve suffering. And these are gifts for patients and providers alike. I feel so fortunate to have had the rewards of such a, a career to be part of a community of like-minded folks around the world. Uh, since Dame Cicely Saunders created the modern discipline of, of palliative care in the 60s, palliative care has grown facing many, many challenges along the way. And then in March, 2020, Canada and earlier in many other parts of the world we as palliative care providers face perhaps the most significant challenge of our time, the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 pandemic, the all-encompassing disease that has impacted each and every one of us personally. But all attention and understandably at first was focused on disease prevention, adequate uh, personal protective equipment, uh, assuring adequate health system capacity. But the elephant in the room was that no one was really talking about how to handle death and dying. Next slide, please. So in a radio interview uh, on CBC, our national broadcaster, in a show with journalist Michael Enright called The Sunday Edition, way back on March 20th, 2020, which just seems an eon ago. So in the very early days of the pandemic here, I raised this point, have a listen. I bring it up to, to raise the issue because it's an issue that I haven't seen really addressed yet, and it's going to be a critical one. Well, the whole issue of palliative care has been kind of, we rarely speak about it, don't we? It doesn't seem to have the attention because it is about dying and not about living. I guess we don't want to know about palliative care all that much. I think it's, it's symptomatic of the usual denial uh, that we have with regards to death and dying. And we don't really want to face that. You know, we're really focused here on trying to prevent illness, uh, prevent suffering, prevent death and dying. Uh, and hence, with all the energy going into that, um, we haven't really looked at the dying part of it. So at the same time, that we do, we need to uh, we need to look at the palliative care needs. In addition, people while they're under care and receiving aggressive care may also have the symptoms that we in palliative care are, are good at addressing, right. um, such as severe shortness of breath, for example. Uh, we're good at that. We can do that. And uh, so, even if people are being aggressively treated, it's not mutually exclusive that they should receive really good palliative care symptom management, if I can put it that way. Dr. Buck. Next slide, please. I bring it up to, to raise the issue. And now, since late last year, the pandemic has decimated our world, wreaking havoc, suffering, and death. Now there are more than 40 million cases, actually, as of yesterday, 44 million cases, and that's only in the five days since I posted this slide. There's now there are more than 1.17 million deaths, and these are the ones we know about uh, and are attributed to COVID-19. But what of the ones we don't know about? 
And one of the ones that are not the direct results of COVID-19, but nonetheless are indirectly a consequence of the pandemic. How do we measure that? Next slide, please. So what is the role of palliative care? How do we as a discipline respond to this pandemic? What is our ethical and what is our social responsibility here? What are our patients' needs? What are the challenges? What gaps and weaknesses were unveiled by the pandemic and indeed are still being revealed? Here in Canada, we failed our seniors in long-term care homes, even as we flattened the curve. So how can palliative care respond to this humanitarian crisis? Next slide, please. During this pandemic, and likely in coming future months, I expect the need for palliative care to increase substantially, especially if we have a twindemic, a convergence of COVID-19 and influenza, which could put the capacity of our healthcare system at risk once again. Next slide, please. Late in March, I co-authored a paper published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal entitled Pandemic Palliative Care Beyond Ventilators and Saving Lives. In it, my co-authors and I outlined some of the challenges that we as palliative care professionals might face in addressing the anticipated high mortality that would be experienced by Canadian residents as a result of the pandemic and how sadly right we were, particularly in long-term care. In these uncertain times, discussions around palliative care have never been more important. Next slide, please. But let me first give a little bit of context about healthcare in Canada. And as many people know, uh, we have universal publicly funded healthcare. Uh, it's administered by our 13 provinces and territories. Citizens and permanent residents receive medically necessary hospital and physician services at the point of use. Prescription drugs and dental care are notable exceptions to the blanket coverage that we have. Some provinces and territories do provide some, some coverage to certain populations, um, but everyone has theoretical access to healthcare, although many inequities to access remain, including for our indigenous populations, uh, those with mental health and addictions, those experiencing homelessness. In general, the more marginalized amongst us. In 2017, a study by the Commonwealth Fund, Canada's health system performance ranked ninth out of 11 high income countries. And according to the Economist Intelligent Unit's 2015 Quality of Death Index, Canada ranked 11th out of 80 countries based on the availability, affordability, and quality of palliative care. Next slide, please. So about death and dying Canada, Stats Canada tells us that uh, each year about 270,000 Canadians die and the majority die of chronic illnesses from cancer to, to frailty. By 2026, uh, our death counts are expected to increase to 330,000 and to 425,000 16 years from now. But despite Canadians wish to die at home, 60% still die in hospitals. Next slide, please. So only 15% of Canadians have access to home-based palliative care, according to the Canadian Institute of Health Information just in 2018. Not very high. But if they do get homeware, they're two and a half times more likely to die at home and way less likely to receive care in an emergency department or intensive care unit. And the age group that gets palliative care in Canada as a rule is that 45 to 74 age group. And it's interesting that um, that adults who have cancer um, are significantly more likely. So more than three times likely to get palliative care versus those with non-malignant disease. So this is palliative care in Canada at the best of times. Um, what has been done to address these significant gaps in services? Next slide, please. So there's actually a disconnect between who gets palliative care in Canada and what Canadians want. 93% of Canadians believe palliative care services should be available in their setting of their choice. 75% indicate a preference to die at home and 52% expect the bulk of those services um, to be provided in their home. Yet only 15%, as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, get this kind of care at home. So we clearly uh, often have a glaring disparity between what a patient envisions for their end of life care and what actually happens. And this may be because community care is simply not available in certain regions, 
uh, or when it is, individuals may have to pay out of pocket expenses for, for nursing or personal care services aren't provided by governments. And many individuals simply can't afford these costs. Next slide, please. So recognizing the gaps in discipline in access and quality of palliative care across Canada, uh, the government uh, released a, a Canadian palliative care framework in 2018 to set a vision, to set the goals, to set the priorities to improve palliative care in this country. Uh, the Canadian Medical Association took part in consultation leading up to this framework and really supports this plan. And we have lots of plans. Uh, the problem has been in its implementation. This is our challenge in this country. But this framework can serve us well as we uh, seek to address the palliative care needs of our patients and families in the pandemic. Next slide, please. So what are those, some of those challenges for accessing hospice palliative care in Canada? Um, here, individuals and groups have had to advocate strongly for the palliative care resources that we do have. The Quality End of Life Care Coalition of Canada is a group of 35 national organizations dedicated to improving end of life care for all Canadians. And the coalition pr produced something called the Blueprint for Action 2020 to 2025 to continue to improve quality hospice palliative care and access for all Canadians and provide, um, provides a summary of progress made to date, what our current knowledge is, what the issues are, what the gaps are. Next slide, please. But what we've observed during the pandemic is there is a changing pattern of, of death. So the questions arise, how many of those dying with COVID-19 would have been in their last year of life in the absence of the pandemic? And Bone and colleagues uh, undertook a study uh, during the first 10 weeks of the pandemic, uh, mostly in the UK, uh, in, in Wales, and discovered that the number of people dying in long-term care actually increased by 220% during the first 10 weeks of the pandemic over there. Uh, home deaths increased by 77% and hospital deaths by 90%. And they used mathematical models to determine that many of these deaths were actually additional deaths that were associated with the pandemic, but not necessarily directly a result of COVID-19. So when they put in their models, they, they, figured, they found out that most people were older than 75 and most occurred in, in their long-term care homes or at home. But their estimate was that only 22% of deaths occurred in people who were in their last year of life. In other words, 78% were directly or indirectly related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. I should mention just, really just before we go that um, it was interesting uh, that hospital deaths increased by 20%, and they didn't comment on, on why that was, but just wonder if it was uh, secondary to visitor restriction policies, not taking patients at the time, but that was an interesting finding as well. So here are some of the headlines we've been reading in Canada and could occur as we experience the second wave. Indeed, as I speak, this appears to be deja vu all over again in this country, particularly in the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. Canada was not prepared for the pandemic, especially uh, in its ability to care for seniors in long-term care. About eight in 10 COVID-19 related deaths in Canada are, were from, from seniors in long-term care facilities. This was double the OECD average in the first wave. By July 7, 2020, the National Institute of Aging reported more than 18,000 cases and over 6,800 deaths among residents of long-term care and retirement homes in Canada, as well as almost 10,000 staff cases and 16 deaths. Next slide, please. The Canadian Institute for Health Information reported that COVID-19 deaths um, in the first way, that Canada fared at just below the OECD average. However, as mentioned, 81% of all COVID-19 deaths in Canada occurred in long-term care, the worst percentage of all OECD countries and more than twice the OECD average of 38% you can see uh, in the bar along the bottom. And, and as well, according to the National Institute on Aging, there were numerous reasons for this sad occurrence. The lack of personal protective equipment for frontline healthcare workers, insufficient infection prevention and control uh, expertise, uneven clinical leadership, personal support workers having to travel from home to home to cobble together full-time full employment, inadequate staffing ratios, leaving residents neglected as the surge hit, uh, chronic under-resourcing, older structures having four residents per room and many other risks, 
there were, incredible, there were slow responses to restrict access, access to long-term care facilities. And these are to a name just but a few. The tracker open working group as of the 1st of October, the, the last and most recent data I could get, found that almost 21,000 of these residents had been infected with COVID-19 and over 7,400 of them died as a result. Again, this amounts to about 80% of all COVID related deaths in Canada. Next slide, please. So we've learned much from this tragedy. We know that we have to correct the gaps and weaknesses in the long-term care system from aging infrastructure to lack of sufficient PPE, et cetera. So we know the numbers, but with regard to palliative care, there is much that we don't know. And these are my questions that you see here in this slide. They disturb me greatly. My suspicion is that most of the seniors who died in long-term care did not receive adequate palliative care. The dedicated nurses and personal support workers who cared for them were too overwhelmed to offer much more than a hand and calm words through a barrier of PPE. Simply put, we were not prepared. The tragedy of long-term care begs for a palliative care approach and advanced care planning discussions and goals of care discussions more than ever. We know that this has been lacking in many long-term care facilities across Canada. We cannot ever right the wrongs of this national shame until a palliative care approach is integrated into long-term care in every jurisdiction in this country. The implications are great. Palliative care must be made available for people dying of COVID-19 and indirectly as well. Next slide, please. Philosophically, palliative care gets ignored. If you're in a crisis and you're trying to save lives with limited resources, you are trying to do just that, save lives. But what happens to the people you can't save? So here's a quote uh, from The Lancet on April 11th of this year. Quote, palliative care ought to be an explicit part of the national and international response plans for COVID-19. At the same time, the World Health Organization issued guidance on how to maintain essential health services during the pandemic, highlighting immunization, maternal care, emergency care, chronic diseases, uh, and among others, but there was no mention of palliative care. Yes, this was an oversight. Indeed, palliative care ought to be an explicit part of national and international response plan for COVID-19. Practical steps can be taken. Ensure access to drugs such as opioids and protective equipment. Consider a greater use of telemedicine and video. Discuss advanced care plans, provide better training and preparation across the health workforce, and embrace the role of lay caregivers in the wider community. Next slide, please. So additional challenges. There are hostile environments for palliative care, and that can be interpreted as unfriendly or inhospitable to palliative care, especially when all efforts and resources are focused on saving lives. Somehow the work of palliative care is judged to be less worthy. Infection control, uh, limits visitors and the involvement of essential family caregivers, as well as the barrier of PPE getting in the way of compassionate care. Being overworked and overburdened because of the number of patients that need to be seen for, for the providers of palliative care is a major challenge too. And again, our ability to deliver care to the family as a unit, which is what we do, it's difficult because patients are so isolated. Next slide, please. So the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed the demand for palliative care now to new levels. And as supply chains have been broken, the demand has surged, we've seen shortages of key equipment and drugs. And it's also brought to light new ethical considerations around allocating critical care resources when demand outweighs capacity. And it's made it even more evident uh, where more gaps in our system are, not just in long-term care. Um, where it, the long-term care idea actually brings to mind is, is enough palliative care being provided outside of hospitals and within the community. Of course, in long-term care is mentioned, but in home care and in hospice care, are there enough hospices? Um, and that includes building stronger connections between primary care and continuing care. The pandemic is changing the way we think and talk about advanced care planning and palliative care as healthcare professionals and as patients. So, uh, in the paper that I published with my uh, co-authors, we outlined the palliative care issues that can be addressed in order to be able to deliver palliative care comprehensively to everyone in a pandemic. And we grouped them according to stuff, staff, space, system, sedation, communications, and equity. I'll talk more about them. Next slide, please. 
Here's another ethical challenge for palliative care in the pandemic, and that is patient autonomy. As palliative care providers, we're usually involved in shared decision-making with our patients who are at the end of life, and we work with them with the decision-making and with their families. In a pandemic or even a twindemic, patient autonomy to choose uh, life prolonging procedures or preferred location at time of death may be severely restricted due to public health directives and limited resource availability. Providing advanced care planning and goals of care discussions preserves this autonomy. When the crisis strikes, there may be less time to have these conversations. And I'll add something if I may here that, and this is something that palliative care providers uh, really know so well, aside benefit, shall I say, when we protect the bioethical principles of autonomy, dignity, and informed consent in healthcare decision-making, even in the uh, constrained and extraordinary situations like a pandemic that we have now, healthcare providers experience a higher meaning and shared purpose of their work. And this is a critical uh, protection against moral distress. Um, and that's become a significant issue for healthcare providers during this pandemic. Next slide, please. So here's another ethical challenge and question. Why has palliative care so often been absent in the humanitarian response to health crisis? My review of the literature in humanitarian crisis suggests that there is a response for everything except palliative care. During the Ebola crisis, for example, in the absence of palliative care specialists and some over, in, in certain countries, some overburdened healthcare providers struggled to care for patients with the disease and expressed frustration at feeling forced to turn treatment facilities into palliative care facilities. Next slide, please. The guiding principles for humanitarian action today, the overall goal of humanity is one, to protect life and health and alleviate suffering wherever it is found. And as well, to do so in an impartial way, the universal and non-discriminatory application of alleviating suffering. What is the power of compassionate palliative care to remind the humanitarian sector of the art of caring, the art of standing with and alongside our patients, of our common human suffering, of our common illness dying, really our common humanity? So let's not underestimate this power of small but potent acts of compassion that is part and parcel of palliative care. Next slide, please. To me, this is an ethical imperative. We cannot abandon the dying. We can take the burden off the hospitals by providing care in the community. We can, as, health, uh, as hospice palliative care teams, help patients and family discuss advanced care planning and goals of care. We can respect autonomy, individual values, and provide individualized person and family-centered care. We can assist in triage protocol discussions. We have that expertise. In 2017, the Lancet Commission on Palliative Care and Pain Relief um, showed that the widespread lack of access to inexpensive and effective interventions of palliative care was described as, next slide please, a travesty of justice. And that was in the so-called best of times. And these are not the best of times. As health systems become strained under COVID-19, providing safe and effective palliative care, including end of life care, becomes especially vital and especially difficult. So this is the bottom line. Providing palliative care is not a choice. It is as critical as any life-saving measure in a humanitarian crisis. Palliative care is active care not just something that one can turn to when everything else has been tried. Next slide, please. Of course, we need to save lives in any humanitarian crisis. We all want that, but this isn't an either or. Can we imagine, reimagine the standard humanitarian response of saving lives to minimize suffering, to encompass both saving lives and minimizing suffering? Let us in the palliative care community in conjunction with all humanitarian stakeholders developed an integrated disaster pandemic response, which includes palliative care as one of its highest priorities. Next slide, please. So what does palliative care have to offer in a pandemic? A little bit of review. Um, we offer relief of suffering, supporting complex decision-making, managing the, all the clinical uncertainty that abounds. We can respond rapidly 
and we can adopt new ways of working as resources become uh, really stretched. Pandemics lead to a surge of these healthcare services. And so we can do this. We are, for example, can relieve overburdened hospitals. I'm developing a, a program in our emergency department in our hospital so we can take care of all the patients that come in. They don't have to be admitted. We'll look after them rapidly in the community. Next slide, please. So given all the pressure that we're all under, these hospice palliative care teams, in addition to a rapid flexible response, we have that expertise to participate in resource allocation triage in the event the healthcare system's capacity is overloaded. We have the expertise to train and support non-specialists in providing symptom management. We can help with shifting resources from these overwhelmed hospitals to the community. We are skilled at providing compassionate support for our colleagues, both palliative care and our general uh, healthcare provider colleagues. We can advocate for patients and families to reduce isolation and balance family and, and patient suffering with the importance of infection control. We can implement really compassionate care. And we can redeploy volunteers to provide psychosocial support and bereavement care in its absence. Next slide, please. Other opportunities? Let's work with primary care to provide 24 seven support. Exactly kind of what I'm doing right now in my hospital. We are skilled at providing compassionate support for our colleagues. We can promote the technology we need. You know, get video, get iPhones and iPads to patients who are uh, restricted or <laughs> who have their visits restricted in hospital. And let's use this pandemic to ensure all future pandemic plans have fully integrated palliative care. Next slide, please. Advanced care planning, this is an urgent priority. As people know, I think it reduces the need for rationing planning for surges in healthcare demand. And it respects autonomy uh, and all the benefits that I alluded to earlier. And then we can proactively coordinate people's care when we know what they want, what they clearly want and their families and substitute decision makers know what they want. It has a range of benefits. There is a reduced use of life staining treatments. There's that increased compliance with patients' end of life wishes that they're being respected, both by us as healthcare providers and by their families. And there's lots of evidence to show that there is significantly reduced depression and anxiety amongst, among brief family members. Next slide, please. So people with, with frailty or comorbid illness should update their advanced care plans and indicate if they wish to avoid transfers to hospital for critical care in the event of serious illness. So we've come to see the pandemic as an opportunity to communicate uh, advanced care plans and documentation between healthcare settings, um, such as between, between primary care and the hospitals, to ensure concordance between preferred and actual care. And perhaps virtual care can, uh, can help in increasing advanced care planning discussions and help explain issues around physical distancing limitations and visits. And before the expected surge in patients, especially again, if we're faced with the twindemic, or if we aren't able to flatten the curve this time, um, we must review treatment plans with our usual patients. Again, those with advanced cancer and organ failure and frailty. These patients are unlikely to survive and recover after admission to ICU. Next slide, please. So in the pandemic context, being admitted to hospital may come with the risk of periods of isolation uh, from the visits uh, and the possibility of dying alone. Again, advanced care planning helps patients and families discuss their concerns and opportunities to address mi misinformation and unfounded fears. They are, they, we're seeing they're just going through so much and a lot of it is, is unfortunate because it's just not true. It dem this also demonstrates, I think, to patients and, and, and their families true patient-centered care. It shows how we as healthcare providers continue to value patient preferences in spite of having to enforce strict infection control measures. Next slide, please. So separation and social isolation of patients from loved ones has been one of our most serious challenges of this pandemic. So as I've mentioned, many facilities are enabled video calling to connect families with family members who are separated because of travel and visitor restrictions. But there's inequities here. Um, many people can't afford to have the technology. Uh, many people um, 
our el or our elder patients don't have the knowledge or the ability to use the technology. So they need help. They need the equipment, first of all, they need phones or iPads to enable to communicate with loved ones and for clinicians to hold these goals of care conversations and family conferences virtually. Let's provide a sufficient supply of personal protective equipment to family members who wish to visit their loved ones at the end of life in every setting, acute care or the community. This is an important, all of these are expenses that we need to take on to provide to all patients. Next slide, please. And the pandemic has prompted a kind of major rethinking of how we offer care and virtual care is but one example. At the Canadian Medical Association, we've been working for several years to expand virtual care. And in March of 2019, we launched a, a, a virtual care task force. Uh, we collaborated with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the, Royal, and the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And we created a roadmap on ways to expand access to virtual care across the country. And that includes taking a coordinated national approach to policy, to governance, to issues such as safety, privacy, consistency, and continuity of care. And then the pandemic was declared. I think we released this uh, in February of 2020 and all of a sudden the pandemic was upon us. And the uptake in virtual care just exploded. In about uh, 10 days, we got more done in virtual care than we were trying to, <laughs> we were trying for 10 years. Um, and so from our perspective, our perspective, this shift is incredibly promising. Virtual care is a really important tool in expanding access to care in Canada, but there remain some considerations to keep in mind. For example, we need to focus uh, or create really a model of virtual care that ensures the equitable access. As I, as I mentioned, it's an extremely complex issue, but there are steps the government can take to help reduce some of the barriers Canadians face. And those steps include uh, promoting digital health literacy and ensuring all Canadians can access broadband internet. This is especially important for our rural, remote and indigenous communities. Next slide, please. So no matter how compassionate we may be, we are limited by the societies and the healthcare systems in which we work. And one of those limitations is the injustice of systemic racism. So I just like to go over this slide here. It's kind of complicated, but on the left side of your, your, your screen, you'll see some recent data that showed the disproportional impact of COVID-19 uh, in Toronto. And it was, it was uh, disproportionate according along racial lines. For example, if you look at the top two, two bars under the black population, these are, are people who live in Toronto, 9% of the population in Toronto is black, but they experienced 21% of COVID-19 cases. Similarly, for the South Asian or Indo-Caribbean uh, Indo community, they make up 13% of our population, but 20% uh, of the COVID cases. Looking at the white population, which makes up 48% here in Toronto, only 17% experienced COVID. So there's a marked disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on racialized and marginalized population. Indeed, in Toronto, 83% of COVID cases have occurred in the racialized population. You know, one of the uh, fundamental premises of palliative care is that patients have the right to decline aggressive intervention like admission to an intensive care unit or, or establishing a do not resuscitate orders. And many studies have shown that those more marginalized and racialized, and I would say that this certainly has been my experience as a palliative care physician providing care for people experiencing homelessness, many often choose aggressive care such as ventilators and feeding tubes and often don't access palliative care because they don't get access, they don't get access so they don't have the conversations and therefore are way less likely to do any advanced care planning. And the literature suggests that it's actually the lack of trust in our healthcare system and that a DNR order may mean that their physicians are giving up on them. Essential workers are often people of color and they've been forced to choose between supporting their families and protecting themselves from COVID-19. And this is an impossible choice. So racialized people in, in countries like Canada and the US are not dying because of no 19, but they're actually dying because of structural racism. If our system becomes overwhelmed, triage protocols will be put in place prioritizing patients with a higher likelihood of surviving until hospital discharge. And racialized individuals, because of generally lower life expectancy, may face an unjust disparity in receiving aggressive care. 
as well. There are implicit, unconscious uh, biases of clinicians that would impact their decisions. Subjective decisions about racialized and more marginalized people's deservedness. We have seen that all too clearly in the treatment of our indigenous peoples in Canada. Clinicians have, have one final chance to honor people's values and identities. And that is the essence of palliative care. We must seek to provide cultural safety, uh, practice cultural humility, humility, and make every effort to understand racialized and indigenous perceptions and practices in death and dying. We need to always earn the trust of those more marginalized. We need to adopt explicit anti-racist stances individually and through our professional associations. Because if we do not, we easily reinforce structural racism. Next slide, please. My paper on pandemic palliative care I referred to earlier stipulated that equity of access to palliative care is a key, key consideration in a pandemic. We, can't, we don't do too well on that front in Canada. This is where I've been working to provide palliative care in recent years. The city streets, homeless shelters, rooming houses, boarding houses, drop-in centers, transitional housing units, subsidized community housing. These patients are unable to self-isolate and are also at risk because of the multiple comorbidities they live with and as mentioned, have limited access to palliative care. The pandemic has demonstrated that palliative care providers should pay greater attention to marginalized patients. When the healthcare system is strained, systemic inequities get worse. Those more marginalized are often not supported by family and loved ones. They may have mental health, addiction, and behavioral issues. This lack of advocates, or no advocacy really, it puts them at risk of being abandoned by the healthcare system at a critical time, such as triage. Again, there may be systemic biases against those of indigenous and racialized backgrounds and people experiencing homelessness. In our paper, my co-authors and I make a plea that all patients must be cared for. Palliative care becomes the compassionate option to counter this inequity. Next slide, please. An interesting idea has been put forward by Drs. Gary Roden and Camilla Zimmerman the leads of palliative care at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center here in Toronto. The lack of sufficient integration of public health and clinical care has been unveiled by the pandemic, especially evident for, uh, for our more marginalized populations, as I've mentioned. And this has hindered the government's and the healthcare system's ability to respond to the pandemic. Palliative care though is often not mainstream in medicine and public health. Uh, interestingly, palliative care and oncology have a strong history of collaboration and integration, attention to the disease, the person, and the social context. Integrating public health and palliative care would facilitate the equitable allocation of resources and redress some of the health inequities unveiled by COVID-19. Uh, for example, here in Toronto, people who are structurally vulnerable and experiencing homelessness um, who were being tested for COVID-19 became able to access individual motel rooms with single bathrooms and meal delivery uh, three times a day. And those of us who work with the homeless population have been advocating for years for adequate and stable housing solutions. And like the rapid uptake of virtual care in the pandemic, housing solutions, albeit temporary, were rapidly created as significant expense. Just why oh why could we, this not have been accomplished over the last several years? At the best of times, our data in this city show that lifespan on our streets in Toronto is somewhere between 34 and 47 years of age, about half that for the Canadian population who live to an average age of 82. Death and access to palliative care is a social justice issue. Next slide, please. There's a saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, the phrase means in a pressure situation such as war or a terrorist attack, even committed atheists may start thinking about God. So what does this mean in a healthcare crisis? Patients are often scared, often alone, without protection, like that soldier in the foxhole. COVID-19 is a disease with only limited treatment, is surging in numbers. It threatens the lives of all of us, clinicians and patients alike. There's an insufficient number of clergy and spiritual care professionals to address the need. For most, spiritual care has been absent for both patient and family during the pandemic. In a crisis of a pandemic, spiritual and bereavement care is often forgotten. Are we in palliative care too? Are we wounded healers? We are seeing the suffering around us. 
But if we become depleted of energy to help, often being surrounded by grief and the post-traumatic stress of our fellow frontline healthcare workers, what are the spiritual needs of ourselves and of our colleagues? If we strive to deliver whole and person and family-centered care, we need to commit to including spiritual and bereavement care. So let's advocate for spiritual care for all, for all of us, patients, families, frontline healthcare workers, all our colleagues. If we don't do it now, when? Next slide, please. So is there some, there's some silver linings here and let's consider the value of health promotion and harm reduction. Um, some of the benefits of these that can occur during the pandemic that I've discussed here today. Has the pandemic provided us with an opportunity really for all societies to actually be more open to talk about death, dying, loss and caregiving as everyone's civic responsibility? Is a talk like this part of that movement? That social relationships are critically important in end of life care and bereavement? Is death literacy awareness improving? I guess that rem remains to be seen. Or will this all be forgotten before long? Will we become complacent again? A hopeful change for the future might be how the pandemic, uh, sorry, how the principle of community engagement um, that was developed by Alan Keller here as part of a broader approach might actually increase the use and the documentation of advanced care planning. Do we have an opportunity to develop compassionate communities? Let's also focus on the quality of people's lives during this pandemic, both those that are dying as well as their loved ones and families who are grieving. Next slide, please. So to sum up, this pandemic has provided an opportunity to reflect on how essential palliative care is in Canadian healthcare and throughout the world. System preparedness has to now include palliative care and to again manage suffering in all their domains, physical, psychosocial, spiritual, that results from this widespread potentially life-limiting disease that so far has no cure or no vaccine. To me, palliative care in a pandemic is an ethical imperative. We cannot abandon the dying. It's critical, it's necessary, it's part and parcel of addressing human suffering in all humanitarian crises. Next slide, please. So I shall end there. I thank you for your attention today. Merci, miigwech. Um, following slides are some of the references for people who are interested or could be provided. But again, thank you for this uh, incredible opportunity to speak to you today about palliative care's role in the pandemic. Thanks. Thank you so, so much. We really, really appreciate your presentations and sharing your insights with us, both you, Esme, and Sandy. Thank you so much for that. We received a lot of questions during the presentation and just to remind everybody, absolutely, we will share this presentation later on. So it will be on eHospice Canada for you to see and to also share it with your networks. Um, just to go to a couple of those questions that we have in the time remaining. The first one is actually for you, Esme. It is about how does enrollment into the collaborative program work and what is the degree granting faculty at the University of Toronto? If you could take that one, Esme. Yes. Uh, hello, am I unmuted? Oh, yes. Um, so I I would suggest you contact me. My email is esme.fuller. Uh, dot, it's Thompson at utoronto.ca. It's music to my ear that you want to join us. So please uh, email me and um, I will put you in connection with the right people. Perfect. Thank you so much for that one. Sandy, for you, in your own practice, what are the key challenges faced during the COVID crisis? And how do you start to overcome some of those? Sorry, you're still muted. Yes, thanks. The, again, the host has to unmute me. Um, yes, um, the key challenges we were facing are, are really some of the ones I outlined. Uh, for example, um, are we able to provide sufficient and timely palliative care to not only patients uh, within hospital, but how do we deal with the uh, patients who are experiencing all the other uh, causes of death 
that we're usually incredibly busy at trying to care for. So the surge has uh, um, actually led to gaps in, in care for patients who are not dying of COVID-19. So similar to that study by Bone in the UK, um, you know, deaths have gone up by huge numbers and uh, yet we have limited resources. How do we, we have to, we've had to mobilize to get more community care going, provide 24 seven coverage for these patients. Um, so everybody's kind of been working uh, extra hard. And in the meantime, it's been slower. We've had to, uh, we had, especially at the beginning, we didn't have adequate personal protective equipment. And now we, we have that kind of equipment, but it's taking, donning it and doffing it. Um, virtual care has helped actually address it. So I've been doing quite a bit more virtual care uh, for my patients. Uh, again, I, can, I get concerned about the equity issues and, and allowing them to have sufficient equipment or internet access. So uh, again, uh, that's kind of what's been happening in my own practice. Thank you so much for that one. A question from Canada. Despite many volunteer PC specialist professionals, we have locally had almost no requests for assistance by the medical care teams in long-term care in our community. Why do you think this is? What happened there? Yeah, um, that's uh, distressing to hear. Um, you know, perhaps uh, people aren't thinking sufficiently about volunteer uh, workers and they are the key and they're the core of palliative care. Um, we're trying to work on, in my hospital in North York, uh, we're trying to work on compassionate North York. In other words, we have to uh, make people in medical teams, healthcare teams in particular, aware of the benefits of uh, utilizing uh, volunteers. There are so many out there. So I think that's, um, that's an oversight. It's a major gap and we have to do a better job at uh, developing our compassionate communities and indicating that uh, volunteers have an essential role as part of the, uh, as part of the palliative care team. Thank you so much for that one. With the second wave, what is what we can do towards this one? You've talked a little bit about potential virtual care, role of volunteers. Where are we going with hospice and palliative care? Well, you know, here again, I saw it as, a, as a, an opportunity. I think people are finally talking about death and dying. You know, can we see this as an opportunity to raise uh, death literacy awareness? Um, again, having talks like this um, and having the discussion, the radio shows, the TV shows, um, or organizations can really take advantage of this to create the public's awareness um, about palliative care, that uh, palliative care earlier in the illness trajectory is much better, that palliative care is about living. Uh, let's work with all our associations to get the message out about the importance of palliative care. It's really a carpe diem moment. Uh, let's seize the day and let's uh, really get the public to understand the value and the benefit of palliative care. Thank you so much for that, Sandy. With the time being a little bit forward, I want to turn it over to Jeffrey Mote now, the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada, for the final wrap-up of the event and the award. All right. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Dr. Buckman, uh, it's great to see you. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Fuller Thompson as well. Uh, thank you for being part of this event. Uh, my name is Jeff Mode again. I'm the CEO of Pallium Canada. I apologize for joining late. We have our strategic planning retreat this week, so I've been preoccupied, but regardless, uh, glad I'm able to connect in. And it gives me great pleasure to present Dr. Buckman with the World Hospice Palliative Gaze Day Special Lecture Award. Um, Dr. Buckman is truly an incredible advocate for palliative care in this country. And if that didn't come through in his words today, I don't know uh, what, could, what could convince you more. And whether that's through um, his clinical practice, his various senior leadership roles in health systems and at the Canadian Medical Association, his publications and manuscripts, um, media appearances, too, too numerous to mention, this is just a very small token of our appreciation for being part of this event and, and for your dedication to the cause. The palliative care sector and the medical system at large is very lucky to have you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Buckman, you'll be receiving a frame certificate in the mail. I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Fuller Thompson for her updates on the work of the Institute. Uh, a recording of today's events will also be made available via eHospice Canada. And a big thank you to all of you for participating in today's webinar and our sponsors, the, the National Institute for Care of the Elderly, ILCA, and Pallium Canada. We look forward to seeing you as part of World Hospice and Palliative Care Day in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Back to
back over to you, Chris. Perfect. That's it. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sandy. That was fabulous.